Good evening. Uh, I'm Dan Colley, the director of the Center for Tropical and Emerging Global Diseases here at UGA. And it's truly a pleasure to welcome everyone here this evening to the first in a new lecture series, Global Health, Voices from the Vanguard. Now, Voices from the Vanguard has grown out of um, a collaboration between Pat Thomas, the Knight Chair in Health and Medical Journalism in the Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communication, and myself in the Center for Tropical and Emerging Global Diseases, with additional support from the President's Venture Fund. And the series, however, was actually founded more broadly on what some of us perceive as a real desire by UGA to provide its students and faculty with perspectives on global issues, including global health. Now, over the last several years, UGA has steadily and very positively chosen to invest in global health-related endeavors. And it has done this through the establishment of units such as the center that I'm director of, the Center for Drug Discovery, the Biomedical Health Sciences Institute, the Institute for Be Behavioral Research, the Knight Chair in Health and Medical Journalism, the College of Public Health, and multiple other programs and the faculty in those programs in veterinary medicine, ecology, agriculture, and the social sciences. Now, such programs have either been at UGA for a long time or are new, but they all bear on global health, and there's actually quite a collection of them. And the purpose of those, obviously, from the university's point of view, is to enrich the milieu of the student experience here at UGA. Now, as we speak this week and next, some of us are working hard to synthesize these multiple successful and burgeoning activities into a broadly encompassing spectrum to try and coalesce interests in global health at UGA. We're doing this by applying through an NIH grant mechanism called Frameworks for Global Health. So, by attending this evening's lecture, you will not only be hearing from one of global health's truly bright stars, and I'll leave it to Dr. Lee to elaborate on our distinguished guest in a minute, but you're also being here is contributing to this grant. Uh, for those of you who write biomedical grants like I do, you can look at voices from the vanguard as preliminary data. Without preliminary data, you pretty much don't get a grant these days. You can think about it, if you're not in the biomedical sciences, as seed money. Voices from the vanguard is what we're using, the kind of thing we're using in this grant. So I will definitely comment on the people here and all of those things in the grant. So I'll end simply by saying that we're gratified that each of you has made the effort to come out this evening. I'm sure you'll be fascinated by what you're going to hear, and I hope that you'll come back for the other three lectures in this series throughout the semester. Uh, each will be quite different uh, because they're meant to, they're designed to try and introduce you to the ways that people innovative people have attacked the problems, the huge challenges of global health. So thank you for coming, and with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. David Lee, our Vice President for Research and Associate Provost. Thank you, Dan, and, uh, and thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, uh, add an administrative welcome, um, administrative but warm welcome to everybody who's uh, here tonight. And I would like to uh, begin by thanking uh, Dan and also Patricia Thomas uh, for taking the initiative to organize what I'm sure is going to be an, a very important, thought-provoking, uh, and uh, informative uh, lecture series, and I'm, I'm delighted to be here to help kick this off. Uh, it's a series of talks by individuals who I think are truly uh, making a difference in the world, and I think that will be very apparent uh, from the talk tonight. And in that vein, I can think of uh, no better way to kick off this series than with tonight's uh, speaker, Victoria Hale, who is currently founder, uh, chief executive officer, and chair of the board of directors of the Institute of One World Health. 
So the relatively dry facts here are that Victoria earned her PhD in pharmaceutical chemistry from UC San Francisco uh, and then uh, moved to the uh, FDA, bypassed the traditional postdoc route and went right to work uh, at the Federal Drug uh, Administration uh, as a reviewer of drug applications and spent five years doing that and I think she would say it was an important formative experience as she uh, gained a lot of important experience working with many drug companies and many, many different drugs and eventually became such an expert that she became one of the FDA's teachers of how that process works. She then went to the other side of the street and went to work with uh, uh, Genentech, which uh, some of you may know is, is one of the granddaddies of the biotechnology uh, industry. Uh, it got started when I was a graduate student and is certainly one of the most successful of the, of the biotechnology companies to this date. And I think she spent about three years there working in their neuropharmacology division. Well, about three years into doing that, I think she got to thinking that there had to be more to life or there had to be more to a satisfying career and perhaps her sense of uh, wanting to do something in terms of social action, social justice, uh, led her to, to take a sabbatical. Uh, and she tells me, I think I got this story straight, that after only about three or four months into that sabbatical, uh, she'd already begun to develop a business plan for what you'll hear about tonight, which is this what has become the Institute for One World Health. Over the next couple of years, she actually set up a, a consulting company uh, to uh, help others with uh, drug development, drug marketing, and so on. Uh, but during that time, and that was also providing valuable experience, during that time uh, really uh, helped this, during that time this, the plan for what she's going to talk about tonight really germinated and, and developed and uh, was, uh, th that experience as a consultant was, was part of the uh, formative period. So um, as a result of this uh, thinking and this uh, soul searching, uh, she came to the conclusion that uh, what she wanted to do was to set up a, a non-profit uh, drug company. And to some, this seems like a, a counterintuitive sort of thing, a non-profit uh, drug company that would address uh, many of the world's important disease problems, orphan diseases, uh, diseases that for one reason or another major pharmaceutical companies and government have decided not to go uh, anywhere near often because there's no major profit at the end of a long and tedious drug uh, discovery and marketing process. Uh, and so uh, she decided to pursue this challenge and I'm sure along the way in the early days got a lot of uh, negative feedback from friends and colleagues who probably thought she was pretty crazy to be uh, pursuing what uh, to many must have seemed like a, uh, a uh, frustrating and, and fruitless uh, uh, course. Well, in fact, she's proved everybody wrong, the naysayers, and over time she's gotten a lot of support from the Bill and uh, Melinda Gates uh, Foundation. Uh, you may know that they're very interested in uh, global diseases. Uh, she's uh, had help from the World uh, Health Organization. Uh, she's partnered effectively with the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, and in fact, now Major Pharma, uh, which had uh, looked at this whole thing skeptically from the beginning, uh, is now looking for ways to partner with her and help her as part of their uh, effort to uh, uh, convince the rest of us that they really do want to do the right thing. And so uh, collectively, uh, with this support, uh, this uh, institute that uh, Victoria has uh, formed uh, is developing and bringing to market, beginning to bring to market, uh, drugs that will uh, be used to treat a variety of very important global diseases uh, such as malaria, uh, such as forms of di uh, uh, diarrhea, uh, leishmaniasis, and others. And so uh, this is, a, as you'll hear, a, a, a remarkable story. And predictably, Victoria has been uh, recognized increasingly uh, for her pioneering and inspiring efforts. Uh, in 2003, she was selected as a Leadership Foundation Fellow of the International Women's Forum. In 2004, she was uh, named to the Scientific American 50, which is an annual list recognizing outstanding acts of leadership in science and technology. 
Also in that same year, she was named one of the outstanding social entrepreneurs uh, by the Schwab Foundation for so Social Entrepreneurship uh, based in uh, Switzerland. Uh, and in this uh, past year, 2005, uh, she was named the winner, uh, Women of the Year uh, by the Women Healthcare uh, Executives Group. Uh, and she's also uh, received honor, other honors, including uh, being asked to uh, be an advisor to the World Health Organization. So I don't want to take any more time here, but I did want to give you uh, the background for this remarkable story. Uh, so without further ado, uh, please join me in thanking Victoria for, uh, for, for being here tonight and, and being the person to help launch this important series. Uh, Victoria, we're really delighted that you're here. Thank you very much. pleasure to be here. Uh, we've talked about this stand for how long? About a year? I think so. I'd like to begin with one little story about uh, Dan, who was a founding scientific advisor of the Institute for One World Health. We came to visit him while he was still at CDC, director of parasitic diseases. And I said, I'm going to start a nonprofit, and I'd like your advice. I'm going to pursue parasitic diseases, and why? Uh, because we know the pharmaceutical industry will admit that that is not an area where we would be competing. And which, which disease should we pursue? Um, Dan had his ideas, and every advisor that I spoke to had their own ideas. And I asked him in the end, do you, do you think it will work? And he said, well, I think you're on the right track, and I think you should give it your best shot. Now, some advisors who I've talked to after the fact, have said, you know, I never did believe that this was going to work. I couldn't tell you that at the time. I kept it to myself, but not, not true for Dan. He hoped, that it, he hoped that it would work. So I can say that he was an early believer. So thank you, Dan, Holly. Okay, so I have a few um, slides regarding uh, a few of the diseases that we'll talk about here and a little bit of statistics. Then we'll get into background of the pharmaceutical industry in this sector and these diseases and why One World Health needed to exist or a nonprofit pharmaceutical sector needed to exist. And I'll go through our lead program in leishmaniasis and then a bit about another program of ours, a malaria project with, with a university, UC Berkeley. And then I'll wind up with a zinger for you, a real uh, challenge um, to you you who are sitting here and your, and your friends nearby. So let's, let's proceed. I'm going to turn this a little bit. So I have to point toward this, right? Let's see. Good, great. So the, the text is very small at the top, but my, my major point here is there's tremendous need um, this slide presents for you overlapping burdens of tropical diseases, including malaria. And the darker sections uh, are ones, the darker countries are ones that have a uh, tremendous number of diseases and inordinate burden. Uh, the hatched sections are ones, it's hard to see, where malaria is um, of highest incidence. I mean, we could dim these lights a little bit. Is that possible? This is going to be a challenge. Great. I think I may take you up on your offer to flip the slides, please. Thank you. Thanks very much. OK, so a little bit about um, why these diseases are important. And I know that those of you who are gathered here at 6 p.m., you should be eating dinner, but thank you for coming. Uh, know that these diseases are important, and you do, you do care for them uh, and people with them, or you wouldn't, you wouldn't be here. Um, these diseases are listed in order of the number of deaths that they cause globally, uh, individuals of all ages, so adults and children are combined here. Uh, and we see that uh, Africa is disproportionately represented, particularly in mal with malaria deaths and HIV um, Respiratory infections and diarrheal diseases are the number one and number three killers. And those are particularly complicated because multiple pathogens are involved. And I propose that the world has shied away from, and scientists have been hesitant 
to tackle these diseases because of the issue of multiple pathogens and that we need to do better and we need to learn to work together if we're going to get at the number one and number three causes of death in the world and we can do it if, if, we, if we come together. Um, in Asia, the leading causes of death are respiratory infections, diarrheal diseases, and TB. So just, you can find these data uh, on the web. It's a place that I, next slide please, um, educated myself uh, growing up in the U.S. I can say I didn't uh, know much about what was going on elsewhere in the world. Um, a little problem arose um, for me as a pharmaceutical scientist. Once you know that certain drugs aren't being developed and they could be developed, how can you, how can you not act? Once you know, how can you continue doing what you're doing? These are, um, back one slide, yeah, sorry. Uh, just, a, uh, just again a reminder that Africa, the African continent disproportionately suffers from deaths due to infectious diseases with Asia and the Middle East uh, in the middle. I was surprised to see, this is um, data from Jeff Sachs, that Europeans have half the number of um, deaths from infectious disease compared to the Americas, and I suppose that is all of the Americas, and that's why it's different. Okay, next slide, thanks. And why do we have these, these problems? Uh, why are there disease disparities? And then why are there, as a consequence of that, um, no, new, no new drugs for some diseases, no new vaccines for some diseases, and that is poverty. It's the ability to pay. It really is, it really is that simple. Uh, it's unfortunate, uh, but, the, but the good part of that is uh, if it's simple, then perhaps there is a remedy that is within reach and that one can imagine and that one can, can put, put forth. Next slide, please. So the problem with a large part of the world living in poverty and a small part of the world not living in poverty is that the small part of the world that has the resources gets the investment the R&D in everything, in technology, but in particular, this slide uh, conveys the 1090 gap and R&D for, for health. And consider the last, the last phrase on the slide. We all have known one person or one family in our life who has experienced the death of a child, and it is a horror, an absolute horror. Um, I hope it hasn't happened to any of you in the room, uh, but it's a very rare occurrence in our world, and we are blessed for, for that. And it is um, obvious, but I think not stated enough, that 98% of the deaths of children or the deaths that occur during childhood occur in the developing world. Just devastating. And it shouldn't happen in the year, in, in this new century. These are this is a photo that I took of young girls in, in Bihar, state of India. It's a very poor state in India where we're doing our first, first program. Next slide. So global health inequities, what are they about? Uh, what causes them? If we understand what causes them, then maybe we can do something about them. Number one is poverty. We can go through the list of, of others, um, but basically, if you, again, are very, very poor, you have different diseases. Okay? And because those diseases are so different, um, organizations that develop new medicines, and I'm not sure that you realize that almost all new medicines in the world, if they are Western medicines, not traditional herbal medicines, are developed by Western pharmaceutical companies. They may not be discovered by Western pharmaceutical companies, they may be discovered by universities, yeah? Uh, but they are developed by Western pharmaceutical companies and go through regulatory agencies. So we need some time for companies in India, okay, in Asia, in India and in China to learn to do the new drug R&D process. And maybe some of this will change, although I'll say to you that um, in my discussions with companies in India, their target markets are the same as pharmaceutical companies in, in the West. So we may maintain this, this problem of no new drug R&D, uh, even though pharmaceutical companies develop the skills elsewhere in the world. Let me add as well, I believe that the world was more concerned with these diseases when colonialism was in vogue, in fashion. When uh, European countries pulled out of, of its colonies, their colonies, um, 
they pulled away uh, their, their compassion, their passion and energy and finances and resources as well, unfortunately. If there is anything good that can come from the military, militarism that is occurring in the world, this little editorial on my part, it would be that it puts Westerners back into parts of the world that we pulled out of um, decades or centuries ago. Um, and I hope that that, that that turns out to be the case. So the neglected diseases, uh, the really neglected diseases, um, are not anymore um, HIV, TB, and malaria. We have a little disagreement about that in the, in the global health sector. Um, I have malaria here on the, on the list. But the general consensus is th something's been going well in global health. There is quite a bit of, of there are quite a, quite a few resources being applied to HIV, TB, and malaria. That still leaves a long list of diseases, however, and diseases that affect uh, half of the world. Uh, if you're talking about nematodes or worms, um, diarrheal diseases is an arena that we're moving into, and it's a tremendous market if you think about it. Um, the top, the top four there. The first two being enteric, and then malaria and schisto, one of Dan's favorites. Um, tremendous markets, but they don't attract industry. They just don't have the ability to pay. Oh, go on, next slide, thanks. So for malaria, just for example, deaths in Africa, okay, almost all deaths from malaria are in Africa. And the mortality is compounded by poor public, public health infrastructure, uh, lack of access to new medicines, lack of education, but most importantly, I, I believe, the social, political, and economic turmoil that leads to or supports a lack of will to make a change. And I'd like to demonstrate by this slide and, and, and make one point here. We all work, work very hard in technology. We live in a, part, in a part of the world that's very technologically oriented. And if a technology is developed, we'll have access to that technology. It will get to us. Um, that is not true in many parts of the world. We can work our hardest, and a miracle can happen, and we can develop a malaria vaccine. Wouldn't that, that would be a miracle at, at this point. It really has you know, incredible coverage. And that doesn't mean that it would save lives right away. There are huge issues after the technology is developed. There are huge issues after regulatory approval, and they don't involve high technology. They involve low technology. They involve going out into very rural places and education and working with governments and generating a will and a force to make something happen. Thank you. So malaria right across the middle, a belt around the middle. Next slide. So focus on drugs now. Uh, Doctors Without Borders did a quick survey uh, of all drugs approved in a 15-year period. So about uh, 1,400 of them, and 13 of them, 1%, were approved for tropical diseases, 1% of, of new drug approvals. The catch to this is only one of them uh, was approved for a tropical disease in humans as its first indication. So this counts second indications, et cetera. Most of these drugs were approved for veterinary disease, okay, for agricultural purposes. First, the animals before the people. It's very unfortunate. Uh, but let's turn that into an opportunity here. We can go to and work with veterinary health, animal health companies, right? They do have these leads, and they are still in the parasitic drug business. Uh, and some of these drugs as well were approved for other indications, oncology, for instance, and then came to tropical diseases. So it's very sad and obvious that um, you saw the list of the number of tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people who have tropical diseases, um, that we have these numbers, these percentages of drug, new drug approvals. So the world has not um, stood, stood by idly and I and my organization and our colleagues and friends were not the first to come up with a solution. The world decided uh, about 10 years ago that there should be public-private partnerships. Okay, so that's the PPP. Um, public always comes first, as it should. The public, public sector players are the leaders in this. And public-private partnerships uh, were developed in response to this market failure. We don't like to say the word market failure when we're talking to pharmaceutical companies. Um, if you want someone to partner with you, you don't like to, you know, rub it in. 
Um, but that's really uh, basically what it, what it is. Um, these programs were generally funded um, not by um, private corporations, or by, not by corporations, however. They were generally funded by um, the public sector. Um, there are about 16, I think, that exist now that develop drugs or vaccines or diagnostics. And it works reasonably well for those three big diseases, which I opened with to tell you they're not so neglected anymore. And one of the reasons they're not so neglected is these exact public-private partnerships that have been able to bring pharmaceutical companies together with the World Health Organization and with universities and with, with um, various players, governments, et cetera, and make this happen. But they're not perfect. Next slide. And these are the reasons. This was part of my strategic analysis of, of what was needed. So early on with public-private partnerships, it was pretty clear to me uh, that we wouldn't be able to, it would work for a few diseases, but we wouldn't be able to attract a company um, to develop a new drug for onchocerciasis. It just wouldn't happen. Um, leishmaniasis. Um, we could, the list goes on. Uh, so it works for some diseases, but not for others. Our first choice was a good old drug that was off patent, an old aminoglycoside. And it was a piece of low-hanging fruit that really was a sure shot. It was a great first, it is a great first product, uh, but it never would have worked in the existing public-private partnerships because there was no intellectual property around it. No, nothing that anyone could own. A generic company anywhere in the world could, could make it. That's okay with us, but that's not okay with uh, pharmaceutical companies who participate in public-private partnerships. Not yet, anyway. It may be in the future. Um, the mission of these public-private partnerships is often quite narrow, as, as it should be. You need to focus on, for instance, the Medicines for Malaria venture, extremely successful in bringing forward new medicines, still in the research stage, the newest ones, new mechanisms of action for malaria. Where do you fit a drug that is old Okay, or off patent uh, in, in that sector, in that, in that PPP, you don't. Where do you fit a new technology to address the shortage in artemisinins that exists? Well, you don't, it doesn't fit the mission. So these PPPs that exist to develop medicines have to stay narrow, except the technologies are not narrow. The beauty of technologies, and in our society, the beauty of science is that the discoveries are, are as wide as we imagine they are. Are as, are as broad and creative as we allow them to be. So we wanted to be an organization that, would, that could take on some of these uh, more creative projects that didn't fit elsewhere. And they're dependent on philanthropy, as we've talked about. That's okay when you're in the research phase, but as these research programs are successful and move up into drill a drug development programs, it gets quite expensive. And our philanthropic organizations, such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, going to be able to fund the development of three antimalarials at one public-private partnership, and eight diagnostics for tuberculosis at another public-private partnership, and four different uh, vaccines for another, another disease elsewhere. I, I don't think we can ask one, one foundation to do that. Uh, I, I think that they, well, they've made it clear that they want other funders to participate. Next slide, please. So, I'll tell you what really inspired me first to believe that we could do this. Once you learn what's going on with global health and how many needs there are, the answer, the, the solution becomes or how many opportunities are there. So, within our, our sector, within the pharmaceutical sector, the, the beauty of it is it's a wealthy sector and there's a lot of money put into discovery. Okay, so, so many more discoveries are made than can, ever be, than can ever be developed. And much of that is what should be mined and pursued for leads for potential new, new medicines. I think I'll skip the rest. But basically, huge untapped potential opportunities. Next slide. So, why a new player was, is, was needed, is needed. Uh, many infectious diseases lack R&D programs. Uh, no one's developing new cures. Um, in addition, there is a tremendous gap between the cultures and the language of the very technical pharmaceutical industry and global health players. Um, there wasn't anyone effectively working that gap. The World Health Organization does its best, but it is a small organization with very little funding. And it appeared to us and to me that there needed to be someone who could, who could bridge the gap who could speak to people in, in global health community about what was needed, what the product would need to look like, uh, what it would need to cost, 
and work with pharmaceutical companies to make that happen. So just a reminder, one billion people live on less than a dollar a day. They need to eat, sleep, dress themselves, children have shelter. Um, about three billion live on less than two dollars a day. So our products have to cost pennies, our drugs. So One World Health was formed with that uh, recognition of tremendous opportunities that come from universities and academia and a very large number of extremely committed scientists, scientists in in my industry who would say to me, if you start it, I'll come. You know the movie, what's it called? If you build it, they will come about the baseball team. What is it called? Field of Dreams. There you go. Um, this is the way One World Health has, has turned out to be. It's, uh, it's very cool. Um, there are many passionate scientists who say, you know, I, I chose this field, I chose this sector because I wanted to help someone. And I can't remember the last time I felt that I did after a day's work. I work hard. I work hard. And my company is good to me. And you know something? I'm not ready to leave quite yet. And in many cases, I have a mortgage, I have kids, I have golden handcuffs. Um, but I want to volunteer for you. Or you know something? Uh, I'm just, I've had, I'm up to here. I want to leave. Um, so we have many more volunteers than we, can, than we can use and wonderful opportunities to tap great employees. So we have 50, about 50 or 55 employees now. We couldn't do any of it without philanthropic investment and almost all of that funding has come from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, $140 million to, to date, just tremendous. Uh, and, and we are but one small nonprofit organization in San Francisco. We will open an office in India but we can't do this without a very large number of partners. And a lot of what I do is build, work on trust and bu building relationships and maintaining relationships. People who work in this sector and companies who come into this sector do not do it for business reasons. It does not make business sense to engage in any of these diseases. You're here because you want to be here, and it's about personal relationships. So it, to, to recognize that uh, is very important, and it takes a lot of energy to maintain them across cultural barriers, age barriers, all, all kinds of barriers. Okay. So One World Health is a simple experiment uh, designed to model the successful pharmaceutical industry. Really, is it this simple? Could we just remove profit and keep everything else the same? So that's what we did. Uh, our first project had to be successful, had to be quick, had to be inexpensive. Otherwise, no one would fund, no one would fund us further. Um, we focused on uh, research and development, in particular development and we focused on drugs. Uh, we do have one vaccine in our portfolio, and that's a little bit of an experiment. Uh, we have a very strategic selection of drugs. We did not want to have to develop a sales and marketing force. Okay? Uh, so choose a drug that will be distributed by others, or can be distributed by others, so that you can just orchestrate and watch. That's naive, isn't it? Watch that distribution happen. It's, not, it's never like that, but, but to approach that. And our first program is in India. Uh, we need to go to Africa and we need to go soon, but we also needed uh, a government that was committed to a particular disease and a reasonable amount of infrastructure. So One World Health, this is our mission statement, develops safe, effective, and affordable for the poorest people in the world, uh, new medicines, new, new medicines for diseases of poverty, for people with diseases of poverty. We identify promising drug candidates. We've had lots of them sent to us. We've had some beautiful insecticides, some uh, fantastic um, advanced bed nets, some incredible rehydration solution. We really try, try to focus on the, on the drugs. Um, there are lots of great technologies that have nowhere to go. And we propped up as a nonprofit health something. And when you Google us, you find us. And so we have, have great opportunities that we'd actually like to share, we'd like to put out publicly rather than just say no thank you to. I'd like to get, have a place for them to go in the world so that people know about them. We complete animal and human clinical trials. That's our primary work. We're in downtown San Francisco. Picture this, we don't have laboratories. We're counting on you to have done the research and for you to have taken the work as far as you can, maybe with a, maybe with a company, maybe, maybe not, and then we pick it up and, and move it from there. This, the work that we do truly depends on, on the work that comes before us and standing on the shoulders of others, leveraging the work of others. 
Um, there is plenty of quality manufacturing in the world. We do not have a factory. I think it would be a great idea to produce, to set up manufacturing facilities in the continent of Africa, have Africans run them and make their own medicines. It's very empowering. Uh, but at this time, we use uh, opportunities that exist in, in India, tremendous manufacturing facilities. We'd like to learn more about China in the near future. And we take it all the way through regulatory approval. Next slide. So our guiding principles. The first, and we got this right away with One World Health and talking with uh, big pharma executives. We passed our business plan through four retired uh, CEOs, and we were uniformly rejected uh, and criticized um, because they thought we were going to compete. So we made that very clear. Um, you didn't read our target diseases. You know, can you even pronounce them? I mean, really, trypanosomiasis and leishmaniasis, come on, this is not diabetes and it's not hypertension, it's not, not even oncology. There are Western diseases that lack therapy. There are many orphan diseases that need therapy. We have been, I don't want to say tempted because we weren't tempted, but there have been organizations who have come to us in, in the U.S. to ask, well, can you please help us with a Huntington's disease drug? We're ready to go now. We've been doing research for 30 years or a Parkinson's disease drug, and we've said, we've said no. There needs to be a path for those, but it won't be at One World Health. Uh, do not duplicate available resources. That's use the manufacturing in India. Uh, focus on development, not research. You do the research and we'll, we'll do the development. Be a bridge between those two sectors that don't speak the same language or the same culture and don't particularly like each other, to tell you the truth, or respect each other. Uh, sustainability is an issue for, for any organization, any nonprofit. And I do believe that One World Health can be partly sustainable in the future. Uh, it is important, however, that our decision of which drugs to develop and which diseases to work in not influence our, our desire to be sustainable, not influence our decision of which drugs to pursue and which diseases to work in. Because if we were only to pursue TB, malaria, HIV, where there is some small Western market, um, then those neglect, very neglected diseases would be very neglected again. So we always will have, will have a, a, a mixture. And everybody has to enjoy themselves or this doesn't work. Everyone has to want to be there and keeping that scenario rolling as people change, as a project change is really a challenge. Keeping your, all, all your partners at the table. So we focus on diseases. Oh, no, this is not what I wanted to say here. Um, this is what One World Health has done that is, I hope, provides a take-home message for, for you if you care to, care to do something like this in the, in the future. And it is to, that we have focused on diseases in uh, uh, new and creative ways with the technologies that we've brought in. Uh, we chose parasitic diseases where there have been, yet, as yet, no vaccines, uh, but drugs do cure, drugs do save lives. Uh, we have believed in and studied old drugs and old technologies. Just because you're new doesn't mean you're better than everything else that's out there, is our, is our philosophy. We adopt high-risk, high-reward reward projects that, that do not go elsewhere. And I encourage you to consider that as well, but I would say that shouldn't be your first project. You should have a project that's a sure shot, that's, that's in the bag, so to speak, and then, and then consider these high-risk, high-reward pro programs. We work hard to provide industry with opportunity to participate, and we're talking with all of them now. It's really wonderful. It's been a fast forward in, in my mind, the time in which it took for, for it to switch between us knocking on industry's door and industry knocking on our door. We said, we want a partner. And they said, well, we'll watch and figure out who you are and if you can develop a drug, and then we'll decide. And now they're all coming to us, which is, which is glorious. Then we can initiate more programs and pass them on and find more opportunities and, and license them out and, and get more done and advance, advance global health and engage the industry. If we don't engage the industry, then we're, we're kidding ourselves, really, uh, about what can be accomplished. So we need, to, we need to work with industry. And you know something? They want to do it. They just have no idea how to do it. They haven't thought about it. Um, so they're very, very you, need to, you need to think differently. OK. So we like to say that we focus on the middle of this slide, the development, the D. So we work on various formulations, preclinical studies, clinical trials, technology transfer for manufacturing, and then regulatory approvals. In reality, that was the case for our first project. 
but we need to back up and move forward um, with some of our other diseases. Um, my challenge as a CEO of this organization is to not have us spread too widely. Not, I'd, I'd rather have us do fewer projects and finish them up and do them well than spread very broadly and be overwhelmed by the number of disciplines that we're engaged in and the number of activities we have or the number of projects that we, that we have. Okay, next slide. So this is our pipeline. Uh, Peromomycin will be submitted, the dossier, regulatory dossier, to the government of India this quarter, Q1. So we expect an answer shortly thereafter. Um, and we hope for an approval, and that's all that I can say. We don't know, and you really do have to wait. Um, having been at, at FDA, sometimes companies are surprised. I don't, you know, I would be very embarrassed if I were surprised uh, with this one, having led this company for some time. Um, we have a small Chagas disease program. We have a large um, artemisinin program that I'll tell you about in a bit. Uh, and we have a diarrhea disease program that's, um, that's coming. We haven't announced that one yet, um, and a vac malaria vaccine. I think I have to speed this up, because we have a little slide to show you. Next slide. Oh, this is visceral leash. Okay, then we'll get to the, the video. Um, our first disease, visceral leash maniasis, Kala Azar, black fever, uh, we chose because it was perfect. It was in a region of the world that was contained. Uh, it is a disease that has no animal reservoir, well, in this part of the world. Um, so if you can treat people and kill sand flies, then you can eliminate the disease. Just a tremendous possibility. Um, the disease was in primarily affecting India, primarily one state, and spreading radially out to Bangladesh and Nepal. Next slide. We had Newsweek produce a five-page piece. Did you see it this summer in the health? The health, special health edition, five pages on visceral leishmaniasis in Newsweek. That's a dream come true. This is one of the photos from, from the photographer. This is one of our physicians in the, in the blue plaid shirt, diagnosing BL in the field. This is another one, one of our sites. Uh, the, the balding man is another of our investigators. Notice in the, on the upper right that he was trained in London and Edinburgh, and he came back to Bihar. All four of our investigators, leash maniacs, uh, trained, trained in the UK. And then, and then came back to run Kala's our clinics. Just tremendous. Uh, one lives in uh, Barnas, Varnasi now, uh, and commutes. Next. This is me learning to palpate uh, livers and spleens with one of our investigators. Next. And our first drug, beautiful peromomycin. Uh, again, an old antibiotic. I've said a lot of this already. Um, the cost per cure will be between 10 and $20. Uh, sounds like a lot if you think about malaria cures. If you're really cured from visceral leishmaniasis, it really only happens once in your life. And present cures are between $100 and $200. So this is a tremendous advance. It's a 21-day intramuscular therapy once a day. We're doing a trial uh, soon that will examine whether 14 days is sufficient if we uh, increase the dose, which would make it by far the shortest therapy. All the other therapies are 28 days or longer. Um, so we are, we are very thrilled with this, with this product. Right? But it's not approved yet, I have to say that. Emphasize, good. This is one of our uh, clinical sites. This is inside one of the buildings that you saw a photo of. Notice the beds have, um, they're nice metal frame beds and the floor is pretty clean. I think they did clean up a little bit before we came. But there are no mattresses on the bed. They're just um, cloth. Uh, the patients are packed in. Uh, children sleep three to a bed in epidemic situations. Uh, Kalazar is a, it's a pretty bad way to die, not that there is a good way to die, uh, but you have basically pancytopenia, so you die of opportunistic infections, a lot like AIDS. Um, you die of the complications of severe anemia, or you die from hemorrhage. It's a, it's a very bad way to go over a period of a few months, so it is a, it's an agonizing, uh, protracted suffering. Next slide. And we received a $30 million grant. All the work that we did in the development of promomycin was $17 million. It actually cost more than that, probably about 25. We're going to cost this out. But we had so many volunteers, we were able to do it for 17. We got a grant recently from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for 30 million to figure out how to get this product out there. Remember when I said we don't do distribution? Well, we don't, but somebody has to do it. And that'll be the government of India 
Well, and the disease exists because some government didn't do its job, yes. So the government of Bihar, and we're relying most heavily on nonprofits, nonprofit organizations, and a little bit on the, on the private sector. From ABC News headquarters in New York, this is World News Tonight. Tonight, ABC News, together with Time Magazine, is launching an unprecedented week-long series, Prescription for Survival, focusing on global health issues that affect all of us. Tonight's subject, the world's worst diseases, and why most of them are ignored by major drug companies, despite the fact that they make millions of people sick. ABC's Judy Muller reports from San Francisco. They're called neglected diseases. Parasitic illnesses that afflict millions of people in poor countries, mostly in Africa and Asia. Neglected because most drug companies don't make medicines for people who cannot afford to pay. These people don't represent a the market. There's no return on investment there. Black fever, almost 100% fatal. Elephantiasis, more than 40 million people disfigured. River blindness, more than a quarter million blinded. Sleeping sickness, also fatal, spread by the teensy fly and the big killers, malaria and children's diarrhea. These neglected tropical diseases aren't being neglected by everyone. They're getting the attention of one organization here in San Francisco. The Institute for One World Health is the nation's first not-for-profit pharmaceutical company. Hi. Company founder Victoria Hale is a former pharmaceutical scientist who came up with a solution. Look for existing drugs that have been dropped by the big companies drugs that could be used to cure these neglected diseases. Her first target, black fever. You hemorrhage and die, it's a terrible way to die. Using an off-patent drug called paramomycin and funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, One World Health has finished clinical trials in India that cured 94% of the patients. Great progress, but there are a lot of other parasites out there. The problem with infectious diseases is the bug that you're going after it changes, it mutates, it develops resistance. So you have to keep developing new medicines, and it is that which is not happening. Drug companies, of course, are businesses, not charities, but some are getting involved. Merck took an existing heartworm medicine for dogs and turned it into a very effective treatment for river blindness in people. We were lucky enough to find something that worked, and we've done what we can to make it available. In fact, we've donated more than a billion tablets. Even so, the diseases that afflict 90% of the world's population get only 10% of the health dollars. Most of those dollars go to Western lifestyle problems, cholesterol, digestive problems, erectile dysfunction. I am frustrated. I, I understand it, though. And I, I believe that the way to address it is not to go in and change this enormous system that exists but to build a system that can work with what already exists and to make it happen. And in one corner of the world, this one company is doing just that. Judy Muller, ABC News, San Francisco. So it is a big deal when ABC News talks about black fever. It really is. Uh, so a lot of good things happening. Now I'm going to wind up and get to that zinger I told you about, that challenge for, for you. Uh, but let me talk for a moment about uh, social entrepreneurship. And then I actually do want to talk about one of our high-risk, high-reward projects. We've won several awards for social entrepreneurship and uh, people have asked me how do you define it. You can Google it and find a few definitions. Um, I, I don't want to define it, I just want to, to share with you my, my thoughts. So the world needs uh, all of us. We're all here for a reason. Uh, you may have found your reason, uh, and some of you may not. Um, if, if as you're wandering through the world, um, something tugs at your heart, um, stop and listen. Uh, it's, it's important to listen. It's important to be quiet. We live in a noisy world where time for silence, and the silence itself doesn't exist. So just a, few, just a few words to contemplate for you, so I'm not going to be silent for you. Okay? 
examine, examine that world and this world and find a significant problem, one that uh, means something to you but that doesn't over, overwhelm you, one that, that's really, that's really um, hard, that really go, go, does something to you. Uh, you're going to need that in the hard days, in the dry periods. You're going to need that, that heart, heartfelt reason for, to, to get you through. Uh, identify opportunities. Don't focus on the, on the problem. Um, focus on the solutions. Talk to lots of people and study the work of others. Um, there have been some pretty impressive efforts that, that in the end, uh, if people had just consulted with uh, mothers who treat babies in the developing world, you would know that that formulation will never work or that price is never going to, 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 to do it. Um, there are lots of people in the world who've thought, who've thought about what you are thinking about tangentially. Acknowledge that there will be obstacles. There will be problems. Um, there, is, there are in, in your laboratories every day, and there are in, in any work that you take on. Sometimes the problems are people in a situation where, where you're impacting uh, a global health situation and you want to affect change. So be aware that it isn't always an experimental problem. It can be a, a personal or human problem. And then persevere, really. It takes tremendous passion and, and keep that vision that you evolve over time. And then stick with it till you finish it. There are also lots of great ideas that when the work gets hard, when the well goes dry, uh, people say, that's it, I've, I've done all that I can. And it's often just after that next mountain that you, that you have success, that, that, there, that there is that uh, oasis, uh, that little bit of water that you need to, uh, to continue. So stay with it. Next slide. And if you are to choose a, a first project, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip this because it says a lot about, about what, we, what we do. But the last point uh, is, it's so important uh, to talk about the work that you do, but I learned in California from the dot-com bust that if you talk too much, you end up not getting your work done, and then your company fails, and then the whole darn sector fails. So keep your head down early. Your first project is everything. Once you have a first success, paths and gates in life open, open up. So really be, be serious and be focused. Thanks. So our, our um, high-risk project that we took on was one uh, that was a bit different from our normal program. Uh, this isn't a drug development. We're not producing a product here. We're addressing a global shortage and a cost problem with uh, artemisinin and antimalarials. So artesanate, artemether, a little bit of artemether perhaps. This is the partnership with University of California, Berkeley, and QB3, Quantitative Biology 3, which is Berkeley, San Francisco, and Santa Cruz campuses. Um, it is very high-risk science, synthetic biology, extremely elegant. Uh, we plan to build a metabolic system within E. coli, take the genes out of uh, Artemisia, the plant that produces Artemisia and antimalarials, and put them into E. coli. Um, it's, it's something. There are high highs and low lows when, when the next gene does or doesn't, doesn't hit it. Um, but we are uh, right on course. The project is uh, 14 months in now. We're actually ahead of milestones, so we're quite pleased with the, with the project. Next slide, just a wrap up of it. So we're working with the uh, Kiesling Lab, uh, chemical engineers at UC Berkeley, and Amris, a small biotech startup, and One World Health. So we will decide as One World Health whether to be the producer, the fermenter of this product uh, in E. coli, uh, or to engage a pharmaceutical partner and have them do it and have them put their name on it. We'd need a substantial philanthropic donation uh, and cut in cost of the product to, to do that. So we're still deciding. There's a lot of business plan work that needs to be done, done now in our organization, and we've, we're paying some really expensive analysts to, uh, to do that and, um, and companies. So the purpose of the project, again, is to is for five year, over five years, reduce the cost um, by fivefold, we're saying, uh, and, and guarantee that there's not a shortage again of these, these very fine antimalarials. So 
to wrap up, there are many global infectious diseases that we can do something about. You read about preventable illnesses and deaths, and there, and there really are, and you're working on many of them in your, in your laboratories, as I learned today. It was a great day, by the way. Thank you. I was, I was uh, tired from it, which is good. Um, most of these problems, however, let's accept that they will not be solved uh, by the current corporations or systems or governments. Uh, that's too bad, uh, but it also is an opportunity. Take those problems and turn them into opportunities. Uh, be, you know, see the, see the positive side. Uh, we have to create the new solutions and the new paths. We can't imagine that those who are in a situation where something is not working will figure out what to do. Sometimes, we, sometimes you need a fresh, freshness from the outside to figure it out. Next slide. So here is the zinger for you, my challenge to you as an audience. And then we'll finish up. Who leads in global health? Does global health need a leader, I suppose, would be the first question. I think that, that the words of um, Conway, what is his first name? I've forgotten. He's the former president of the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, used a few words at a global health conference. He said, the state of global health is total anarchy. And I, if you think about it, everyone is doing their own thing and working, working by themselves. And my, my reflection on that was, but is, is that a problem? Um, is there one right way to do things? Is there one group who knows better than others? So who, who is leading? It, I'll tell you from partnerships with the WHO, it's not. Um, is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation leading? They're told you, you are leading whether they want to or not, they're told they're leading. And they say, we don't want to lead. We want to empower. We want to fund. Um, so we have a reluctant, reluctant leader. Is the NIH leading? Not, not in global health, in the CDC, perhaps in some element of global health and epidemiology and some other, other spheres. Uh, there's a question of which continent is leading. Who cares more? Who has more schools of tropical medicine? Hmm? Which governments give more money? Hmm? Does that define leadership? Uh, and finally, this is it for you. Is Harvard the university that leads in global health? So here's my challenge on the next slide. They certainly have the most resources and can get the most attention. So I have a proposal for you, for the state of Georgia, actually. I propose that Georgia has a critical mass of expertise and passion and vision and leadership. And if you got it all together, now that's the challenge, right? get everyone to come together and work together, that, that you'd be quite a force, quite a force to deal with. Uh, so I challenge you to do that. And all that you would need, you, have the, you need three things to, to make this happen. You need passionate people, and I, you, you really have them in, in this group. I may not have named the alliance, the government alliance correctly, and I'm sure I'm missing a few initiatives that, that, we've, that we've talked about today. Uh, you have the people, very passionate, and in critical mass. You have the technologies, okay? They exist, or you can access them, okay? All that you need is funding, and I have that solved here too. Next slide, okay? What do you think about the Georgian go global lights? Isn't that good? Or the Georgian dozen, or the Georgian dreamers. Uh, you, you have that here, too. You really, really do. And all you have to do is believe it and, and go out and ask for it and make it happen. And as I offered today at lunch, if you need a nonprofit pharmaceutical company, we'll open an office in Georgia. I don't know that you do. If you decide to go the drug development path, then OK. There are lots of things you can do in global health. But I, but I, I really encourage you to, can you back up one slide? Really, really think about, really think about taking a leadership role, really thinking about leaving affiliations at the door, leaving egos at the door, so personal and, and professional, and really coming together. It's tremendous what you have, it really is. Uh, I will tell you, though, to be honest, I'm working with the University of California and telling them the same thing. But I think, I think that you, you're way ahead in terms of a probability of success compared to the University of California and Stanford. Um, uh, so I, I'm available for consultation anytime, pro bono, okay? Okay, let me wrap it up now here. Okay, so in conclusion, a nonprofit pharmaceutical company can exist and should exist 
needs to exist. Nonprofit vaccine companies, they're coming along. We know of two that we, that we really helped, and they exist now. You'll hear from one of them in one of your lectures, one of the four um, speakers. Um, and we're thriving. I'll, I'll tell you honestly, it's still hard. I, don't, I have two sons, 13 and 7, and they balance my life. I have a wonderful husband that works with me, too. Um, my children give us balance in life, but I don't get home for dinner enough. So I'm not saying anywhere here that it's easy. It, it's hard still. And I think that anything worthwhile is hard. Uh, and and that, that's okay. Uh, if you're in a place in life where that's what you want to do. Industry and academic scientists are very anxious. Here you are. Um, to, to get going and to advance technologies specifically for these neglected diseases. Uh, young scientists give me hope for the future. The, the incredible volume, volume of passion that comes through emails and letters uh, from young people. Please, may I have just two minutes of your time? I want, I'm going to live 100 years because of all of these technologies that we have. 100 more years, I'm going to be on this globe, okay? And it's a freaking mess. And I want to do something about it. I want to commit personally to do something about it. Please tell me what to do with my career, with my life. Just, just steer me toward a path, and then I'll take it. Just two minutes' time. And we, we don't have time. We're, we're doing other things. So we have an email message that we, that we send back. It doesn't matter what path you take. There are, there are so many opportunities. There is not one path. There are so, so many paths. Uh, but keep that, keep that um, spark that you have. I said to a few of my hosts here today, I haven't been on an undergraduate campus in a while. UCSF is all graduate. I spend, spend quite a bit of time there. And I guess I'm at Berkeley when classes are going on. I don't see the students. They look so young. Of course, I'm not, I'm not aging myself. Uh, but that passion, it, it, it truly does give me hope that whatever we begin now will be taken on and, and continued by, by future generations. I absolutely believe that. I have no doubts at all. Um, leadership. Leadership is desperately lacking. Don't let that be a deterrent. Uh, it just means that you may have to lead yourself at times. Uh, keep that vision clear when you, when you do lead. Uh, industry does want to participate. They, they don't know how. They're waiting for you to ask, convince them to make it, to make it right for them. Uh, and it's not just the pharmaceutical industry. There are lots of industries. We have fantastic offers from IBM and Intel and I don't know who, who else to, to offering what they can to, to advance global health. I bet you could get one from Coca-Cola if you knocked on a door, yeah? And there's plenty of money in the world. You must believe that. There truly is plenty of money. Uh, it's our job as scientists. We, we don't do a good job of translating the importance of what we do, the significance of what we do. There is fear of biotechnology in Europe and therefore in Africa. How did that happen? That's our fault. That's our responsibility. And if we're unable to attract other families, other than the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, into global health, although Rockefeller's been there, and the, and the Welcome family, which I don't think they exist anymore, but were there very, very early. Um, if we can't inv invite any other families and convince them to be in global health, then, that, then that's our fault. It really is. We're not, we're not trying hard enough. Because there are many, many, many families who have considerable wealth, and they want to leave a legacy in the world. They want to leave an imprint, and they don't know what to do. They really don't know what to do, and they're begging. Okay, next slide. So thank you to all of our partners, in particular uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. 98% of our funding, um, we've gotten to know them very well and would, would not be here with, without them. They believed in us early in technology and in entrepreneurs, and we put that together. Which that's what we're trying to do here, put them together. Uh, and all of our, all of our partners. Next slide. Thank you, Dan and Pat, and the university and the center. I think I forgot a word in the center. Global. Yeah, oh my goodness. Yes, okay. I'll get next. Invite me back next time, I'll get it right. Okay. Do what? No, this is it. This is my, my life philosophy. Uh, never believe that a small number of people can change the world. It, it truly is the only thing that, that ever has. Thank you.